All right, folks, we are, um, I'm really pleased to uh, have Alex Wolfowski with us today. He's going to share some new work that he and his team are doing on community aware um, network estimation models. Um, Alex is, um, you know, been working on uh, modeling network data for some time within the causal inference frame and within this uh, sort of network um, uh, latent space kind of models. He's co-author of the uh, Additive and Multiplicative Effects Net and Networks model of the AMEN package um, with Peter Hoff and has been, um, like I said, really developing these, these cutting edge models for some time. So it's really great to have you here, Alex. And, um, you know, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, I, what, what am I supposed to do with the floor is mine. I, so I, I guess <laughs> the, I, I can ask sort of how many people watch the video and if the answer is on the order of zero uh then we can i can talk a little bit about that stuff or if anyone has questions off the bat that's also fine i think a, a little overview might go a long way all right perfect let me share screen and uh do just that um i don't know why it's on this page there we go all right so So I'm not going to go through all the slides unless there's, you know, a huge demand for that. But, and I, I assume that everyone is aware why we want to model networks or why we want to study networks. Otherwise, you probably wouldn't be here. Um, but so the two things that I'm, uh, that I concentrate on during my talk and sort of what I've been working on a lot is, you know, how to use networks when you're doing causal inference and then uh, while I call this task link prediction, it's really just sort of learning about the connection between maybe some kind of individual characteristics and the way in which individuals form ties. Um, and while I'm fairly agnostic as to what kind of individuals, it be you know countries or people, uh, turns out uh, we all sort of behave in very similar ways. And so the, the motivating example that um, we I usually start with when I talk about developing these latent space models is a, one of sort of what's colloquially known as network regression. And so imagine that you have some information about ties. So here, YIJ is the uh, amount of exports from country I to country J. XIJ is some measure of GDP. So it's I think it's log GDP of country I plus log GDP of country B. J and so on, and a few other things. And so you have essentially n squared observations, right? And you can run regression. Um, so you can do ordinary least squares, right? So there's some matrix of covariance X, and then this is what it looks like. And one of the things that we learn uh, sort of in STAT 101 is you should, if you are going to run some kind of regression, maybe you should plot the residuals and see if there's any patterns in the residuals. And if there are patterns in the residuals, then uh, things are not good because patterns in the residuals means that you haven't actually ca captured all of the variability and maybe you've uh, sort of biased your estimate in some weird direction. And so what we're seeing here is some kind of summaries of the residuals from this regression. Now, I'm sort of hiding a lot of the machinery under um, the table here, but essentially we're looking at right, why is this n by n matrix, right? It's the matrix of uh, exports and imports. And what I, we're seeing here is uh, pictures of the eigenvectors, the right eigenvectors and the left eigenvectors of the residuals when you subtract out the OLS estimate. And what it's colored here based on regions, I think these are UN regions. And as you can see, they're all highly structured, right? Like all the yellows that are up here, all the purples and pinks are down here, the greens are here, similarly on the other side. And so that suggests that you haven't captured all the variability and you need to capture that variability somehow. Now, because this is a geography problem, you probably could guess what is the correlation structure between countries and you could embed it directly into E and then you could probably do some kind of generalized least squares estimation. But in reality, you probably don't know what it is in most problems. And so uh, the goal of latent space models is to try to resolve part of this issue. The other thing I wanted to mention is sort of trying to learn something um, about 
some kind of treatment that you might give to people in a network. And I think Paul uh, talked a lot about uh, different sort of causal problems. So I don't want to sort of rehash everything. But if the goal is to learn something like a total network effect of treating everybody in the network versus treating nobody in the network, then it turns out that there is something called graph cluster randomization that allows you to do that in a fairly efficient way that's fairly unbiased, even though you don't actually treat the whole network. But it turns out that these uh, algorithms that were designed you know, within the last decade um, ignore a lot of the structure that there might be about the in the network. And so again, you might want to try to leverage the structure in order to improve estimation of quantities like this. Um, so uh, I, I, I'm not going to go through code, but um, at the end of this talk, I sort of went over how to run things in the Amen package and how to use uh, the tools in this latent network regression package uh, or uh, code base um, in order to sort of do general network regression and then our new version thereof. Um, and then this, uh, I think if, did Peter already talk about community detection? So um, if they yeah, keep yeah. it. Yeah, so he probably said how to do community detection. Well, in that case, just use whatever he said, and then you could also do uh, higher quality experimentation using sort of the algorithms that we've designed, but using off the shelf tools. So um, I don't wanna go like too, too in detail, but the general goal, right, is to study some kind of dyadic relationship and relate it to potentially some kind of node specific or dyad specific information. So this could be, you know, uh, the grade or the age of an individual and this dyadic information could be, they belong to the same club. And so your question is, does belonging to the same club make it more likely that I says that J is their friend, right? That would be the, the question to ask. Um, and sort of the, the key that we're building on is, this uh, work from the 60s and 70s on social relation models, which are essentially versions of ANOVA, right? This is a decomposition of maybe a continuous type of interaction, like how much does I like J, right? Some intrinsic like measure. And it's decomposed into how much does I like people in general and how likable is J, right? So a notion of sociability and popularity. We can amend this to start introducing sort of different covariates. So there can be these dyadic covariates, these row covariates, these column covariates. And, um, uh, you know, there's sort of a lot of things we can discuss here. So if any questions come up, I'm happy to uh, talk about them. But while in general, it's true that XR equals XC equals, it's sort of being treated as the same, it's possible that you might have expert knowledge and you don't want to feed all of the same Xs into all of these things. So the example here is, uh, you know, athletic success might make sense as a um, column covariate, but maybe not as a row covariate. And what's nice is that this can be fit directly in the amen package just with one line. Um, but the claim, and uh, we can sort of think about why this is true. The claim here is that there still might be excess variance inside the epsilon ijs. So, so far we've really just been able to adjust for um, you know, individual level heterogeneity, but we haven't been able to talk about uh, how does my behavior, if my behavior is, as a sender of ties is similar to your behavior as a sender of ties, does that make us send ties to the same people? There's no way to really capture that here. And that's sort of this notion of either homophily or stochastic equivalence, sort of slightly, um, uh, th these are important things that we know from sort of the applied literature that they're definitely present, right? Similar people do act similarly. And we would like to capture that here. And then it's currently not possible to capture this setup. And so to do that, um, so this is sort of examples of homophily. So my friends are likely to be uh, friends with each other and stochastic equivalents, people who behave like me, people who are like me behave like me. So if you think about what these pictures represent is sort of embedding of you in uh, two-dimensional space. And this person 
being close to this person means that they are similar in this latent space. And as you can see, everybody in this community sends ties to this community and pretty much everybody here sends ties here. And so even though none of these people are connected to each other, or almost none of them are connected to each other, they're still behaving similarly. And so this is why it's possible to be stochastically equivalent, but not necessarily homophilous. So how do we capture this? And it turns out that this type of sort of um, triadic behavior, right? How do you sort of uh, capture that my friend is uh, likely to, my friend's friend is likely to be my friend, uh, can be captured by these types of multiplicative effects. So you can naturally think about observable homophily, right? So if I'm, I'm fairly confident that if two people, two students belong to the same uh, club, they're likely to, um, it, they're likely to be friends, right? And so if I introduce this, uh, if XI is, do you belong to club, to the best baseball team and XJ is, do you belong to the baseball team for person J? then if both people belong to the baseball team, it's definitely way more likely that they're going to be uh, friends. You can sort of generalize this to higher order stuff. Um, and in general, you could also imagine that there might be things that are unobserved, right? There's still excess information that is not captured just by the clubs people belong to. And because of that, we might be interested in introducing random effects, multiplicative random effects. So, these multiplicative random effects are going to be able to capture this type of triadic behavior in the following way. So these sort of uh, last few bullet points. So if UI is information about the sender, VJ is information about the receiver, then if UI is e approximately equal to VJ, so if you belong to the same space uh, as a sender, as somebody else as a receiver, then you're likely to be connected, right? Because UI transpose VJ is gonna be big, and so Y is going to be bigger. I'm using the word connected to sort of imply big Y, right? So you're really friendly with each other. We're going to translate that to binary variables in a second. And similarly, you can capture uh, stochastic equivalence because if my UI is similar to my UJ, then UI transpose VK is the same as UJ transpose VK, right? So if we, if I occupy the same space as a sender as you, our interaction with all receivers is going to be similar. And so that's stochastic equivalence. And it turns out that the stochastic block model, which uh, is sort of talked about ad nauseum when you talk about uh, community detection is in fact, just a submodel of this universe. So why do I need to, so this is how you would do it for binary data. You would introduce this latent embedding and you would say YIJ is the indicator that the ZIJ is positive. And that's why I kept saying, oh, UI transpose VJ being positive means you're more likely to be friends because it will push this ZIJ to be bigger. And so it will make it more likely that you've observed uh, a YIJ that's equal to one. Everything else sort of remains the same. and I. I'm happy to sort of talk about the actual machinery for doing the estimation, but uh, we can just think about it on this latent scale if necessary. So uh, we can take a look at this ad health data and uh, sort of to motivate why we need to improve on this model. And um, essentially, why do we study things like ad health? Because we might want to identify at risk youth and design better interventions. And I think we all can probably agree that uh, if you're trying to design a smoking cessation intervention, if you knew that some people are smokers because of reason one, and some people are smokers because of reason two, and those two reasons are sufficiently different, you want to intervene differently on these people. Those reasons for us are gonna be sort of latent communities that are not necessarily grayed or belonging to the same club or something like that. And so if we can detect those latent communities, maybe we should, would be able to identify how to better intervene or who to intervene on in which way. Um, I will not talk about like why data are fully observed as an assumption that I list, other than to say that most network data are not fully observed and you have to deal with that. Uh, and in the AMEN 
uh, package and sort of in the in all of the work that's in that we describe algorithm or sort of approaches to model uh, not fully observed data like cat health. But what I want to concentrate on is sort of this idea that covariates of network uh, the effect of covariates might be different across units, right? And so this is these latent communities that might uh, lead to sort of different uh, behaviors. So here is a uh, one male male friendship network. We fit uh, sort of a very basic model to it. There's row and column covariates. You see that uh, sport involvement uh, increase is, has a positive effect on you, uh, on, sorry, on your popularity. Um, being white in this particular school has a negative effect on your sociability and so on. Uh, this is sort of not a very exciting school yet. Now let's imagine that some Oracle came and told you, or you ran some uh, community detection algorithm on this and then said, okay, well now I have two communities. Let me try to do, uh, uh, model the networks of those communities. And so here we've done exactly that. So this is a naive way of splitting the network into two communities and doing the exact same network regression in each of them. And you see that some of the communities are slightly different. And so this motivates us, right? It looks like GPA is negatively related in the black community in the community one and uh, positively related in community two. So we need to, this is sort of a very naive approach. And what we did is we designed sort of a simultaneous way of learning the communities and learning these differential uh, uh, effects of the different covariates. So, what does that mean? Essentially, we want these betas to depend on some kind of function G where G is a map into a community, right? That's essentially all we want. And it turns out that, remember, the U's and V's somehow relate us to stochastic block models. If we can map these G's to the U's, then we can actually design a fairly efficient algorithm for doing estimation. And that's exactly what we did. So uh, I slight abuse of notation. And if uh, this is sort of not uh, obvious to you why this is an abuse of notation, it's not very important, but this is D is not identifiable in the original model. Um, but think about U as now being a binary matrix where each row represents which of K communities does each person belong to. So there's N people, K communities, you know K a priori, somebody told you how many communities there are. And if there's a one in the third column for person seven, that means that person belongs to community three. Similarly, you can think about uh, communities as receivers. So you could have different communities of senders and receivers. And I'm gonna skip sort of the machinery, but it turns out that you can write down the same exact model in this way where the important thing here is that the same U uh, uh, exists both here and here. And the other thing that's important is that this is a really easy uh, linear algebra operation. Furthermore, it turns out that if you have like equal sized communities, then these beta tildes, which is uh, the, um, the beta tildes here represent the community specific effect. So if there's K communities, then beta tilde one is going to be the effect of that covariate on people in community one. And it turns out that their average is equal on, if you do some kind of estimation, the estimated average of these guys is the same as the estimated thing that ignores community structure. So that tells you that this could be very problematic. If you've estimated a zero, that could just be because there's a community for which you have a very positive effect and a community for which you have a very negative effect of that covariate. Um, I, this is just a bake-off that tells you that our thing works. So this is, you see this sort of in, in, in practice. So this is ignoring community structure and you're recovering the average, whereas our thing is able to detect. And when there isn't anything, it just says that all of them are essentially the same and sort of future work is trying to do this more uh, um, uh, sort of in a faster, more easier way. Um, I'm gonna skip the discussion of this actual schools, but they're slightly different. And in one of them, there was a little bit of a community differential and the other one there's not. Um, 
are there any questions before I sort of talk about these experiments? Because the experiments are a little bit different. Uh, <laughs> well, there are no questions. I can keep sort of giving an up. Oh, Alison has a question, please. I guess I wonder, because it seems like such a rigorous approach. I've never used this, but why wouldn't you be able to use your approach or like what data limitations or why wouldn't someone do this? That's a good question. They should, everyone should be doing this. Uh, <laughs> so, I mean, there's a lot of, uh, I mean, there's a lot of stuff hiding under, under the rug and I'm gonna skip this and just show you some pictures. So, you know, this is the, the code for running the, just the basic vanilla AMAN package. And what it does, it's a, it's a Bayesian procedure. And so uh, what this function is going to do is it's going to run a Mark, uh, um, Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithm. You're going to end up with a Markov chain. And what you're seeing here is sort of output that happens during the run. And so this, was, this is a trace plot, right? And it tells you that in this particular example, it seems to be mixing reasonably well. You've hit stationarity. And if those words don't really mean much, all this is saying is that it seems to be working. The actual algorithm seems to be working. However, it could be slow. And even though here it's only like 400 runs and it seems to have worked out, uh, in the papers, whenever we study a man, uh, the, the ad health data set, you know, you need like hundreds of thousands of runs. And so in the in the community adaptive one, you need even more because it's a much harder identification problem. And so that's one reason why a lot of people sort of shy away from this. Now, some of us have thought about fast approximations to this, but it turns out that fast approximations to this inference procedure are really hard. Um, and the ones that are available uh, are not amazing. So that's one reason why somebody might not do this. The other reason is that uh, while I guess you could try to um, perform inference on triangle counts within this model, uh, it doesn't really, there's no real reason to do that. And so there's not a lot of good, um, so, so we don't. And sometimes people like doing inference on triangle counts. Um, I will leave that to sort of Jim to remind me why that's important, but uh, but right, so like if you are interested in understanding whether or not you have a lot of closed triads or if you have, you know, the open stuff and those are important to you from a, um, from an applied perspective, this is not really giving you that. This is really connecting covariates to um, this, to, to the observed values. And essentially all of the stuff that if you've, heard the ergum talks, all of the stuff that's being done inside the ergum world is going to essentially get swallowed by a lot of this random effect stuff that's going on here. So for example, uh, the epsilon ijs completely capture reciprocity. Now, I think it's actually a very interpretable parameter. There's a correlation between epsilon ij and epsilon ji. And I think that that would be fine to report as a reciprocity parameter. That's how we do it. But if you come from a tradition of discussing reciprocity by counting a bunch of um, network statistics, that's where things become sort of um, less. And so like you wouldn't include number of stars as a predictor because it just doesn't make sense because that's sort of not what this is supposed to be doing. I think Alex is actually being a little um, humble here. I think the actual, the honest truth is that people should be using this unless they have a specific interest in those other features um, because it's the case and i think there's some i think the, the reason people don't is it probably has more to do with um alex and peter haven't been out um, advertising the model perhaps as much as some of their colleagues are in other in other model sets but uh, to me this is a, especially if you don't i think in many applied contexts particularly the health context we don't have a good intuition about um, some of these other you know, classic ergon parameters. 
nor do we particularly care about them. Now, there are some sociological contexts where we really do care about them. In those cases, you should use them. Um, but if you're really interested in an intervention or the association of you know, being an athlete versus not on the effectiveness of smoking, um, then like, you don't care about transitivity per se. And so it really does depend on the context. And, if, and in those cases where you don't need to know that information, this model does a much, I think is, is much less likely, you're much less likely to make a, a, a model inference mistake with this model than you are with the other. Is that fair, Alex? Uh, yes, I think that that is accurate. Yeah. And, and you know, there's a, a bunch of fail safes that are built into this. Sorry if I'm giving everyone a headache by scrolling, but um, the bottom four parameters here are uh, four pictures are really posterior predictive checks. So what, what this is doing is it's as the red line is some observed value in your from the data. And what these distributions are, are conditional on the observed data, I'm going to generate new data and ask, what is the value of this statistic? And as you can see on the first three, this particular example works well, but for some reason it's not working well here. It's not working well here because in the way that this specific chain was run, there is in fact triadic dependence, but we set the number of multiplicative effects to zero. And so this model has no chance. And so if you were to then rerun this with uh, the number of uh, multiplicative effects set to two, then this would look much better. What's cool sort of about this Bayesian universe, um, and it doesn't have to be Bayesian, but what's cool about this likelihood-based universe is that you get to decide how to evaluate model fit. And we already have a lot of very, very high quality model selection criteria. And so you can actually apply pretty much any of the universe of BIC, AIC type of things in order to do variable selection and to sort of reduce model complexity. And then depending on what aspects of the data you care about, you can actually evaluate whether or not the particular specification of the model appears to be capturing what is observed in the current data. So for example, if you did for some reason worry about the number of triangles, you could, this is exactly what this is doing. This is capturing triadic dependence in um, the newly simulated data. And so if this fourth one was sort of the red line was hitting the, the blue dot, the, the blue picture really well, that means that the model appears to be capturing triadic dependence correctly. So it does have that ability here. Um, I, I, I do wanna advertise, I don't know if it's this one, but Peter uh, uh, Hoff, who's also a professor at Duke, has written a whole primer on how to do this. and. There is a large uptake of this model uh, universe in the political science literature. Oh, so Mike Ward, who was also at Duke for a while, but also at UW, uh, is a political scientist who was studying international relations. And him and his um, students have been using these this model set uh, for a while. So, uh, but I, I do think that there are a few difficulties here. I, I once gave a talk at the Ad Health. Uh, users conference about this. And it was not obvious that there was anyone in the audience who, uh, I gave the wrong talk. I, I gave a talk about the how to do this and that was not the right talk. So I should have given a talk on how to run this, which is different. Right, that's a different point, right. Awesome. Um, I know we're time limited, but um, if there are any other questions, I'm happy to take them. And I do think the other thing that people do be aware of is these models are computationally, you know, cumbersome. You do have to spend some, you have to plan your model specifications carefully and be, just be aware of that. So. Yeah. Um, so the only other thing I will uh, sort of maybe sell a little bit is so in the AMEN package, there is a way of fitting this. If you have continuously observed interactions, then you can run this normal model. If you have binary interactions, then the binary model. If you have ordinal, so you just know that you know one is less than two is less than three, but you don't know the magnitude of the difference, you can run those models. And then these two, and the third, the last one is sort of 
funky, but FRN is the fixed rank nomination scheme. And that is exactly how I would guess almost all school related network data are collected. So this is, you go in, you give somebody a roster and you say, hey, tell me your top five friends. And so this fixed rank nomination scheme or this uh, constraint, uh, censored binary one, they do the same thing. Fixed rank nomination does ordinal plus censoring. Uh, censored binary just does censoring plus binary. And what's really cool is that it works really, really well at recovering parameters. So it turns out that there is a lot of juice in the ad health data, but it, but if you treat the ad health data as binary, which is the fully observed version of this, it will perform, you, do, you won't know that you're doing a really bad job, but it will do a really bad job. And in the new work, we've implemented both a binary and a censored binary version of it as well. So uh, we don't have the fixed rank nomination, partially because it is actually really hard to implement this added flexibility in there. Um, the one thing that, uh, so this is all work by Heather Matthews who just graduated. Um, uh, and uh, one thing that she did is she made it easier for you to specify your priors if you wanted to change them, which I think is uh, a little bit missing in the other paper. And that's one way to also speed, having good priors probably speeds up the, re, the, uh, the it does, yeah. it does. Uh, and in fact, uh, this uh, is a, not a greatly named uh, variable, but uh, if you have a, this is about initializing the use, the uh, community, uh, 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 the, the community uh, of values, which community each person belongs to. And you can do it either in a smart way, which we discussed in the paper, which is essentially doing a, high quality non-Bayesian estimate that takes a fraction of a second. And if you start there, then everything runs really well and smoothly like butter. If you set this to be true and you start at a random initialization, so you essentially flip a coin for each person, which community they belong to, um, it will finish eventually. Uh, but what it needs to do because of the way this is set up is it's extremely computationally intensive for it to get everybody into the right communities uh, if you started somewhere completely arbitrary. So that is uh, pretty important. Awesome. Well, thanks for sharing this work with us, Alex. We appreciate it. Definitely. Um, yeah. The only thing I would say about the, uh, the experiments is uh, turns out community structure should be used in general. And uh, this is the graph cluster randomization design. And this is our version of it. And if you can tell, triangles are one community, circles are another community. And so this purple group is in both the triangle and the circle community. And we make the argument that you should just be in the red community, in the triangle community or in the uh, circle community, but nothing should cross when you're doing design. And uh, I'll leave it at that, but you should always use as much information as you can uh, when doing design. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you much. Um, we're going to shift gears a little bit. I'm going to end up the day. Uh, thankfully, uh, Craig is able to join us. He's um, joining us from the West Coast, I think, right? Are you, are you have a jet flag at this point? Did you make it back out there? Yeah, thank you all. Um, going after Alex is uh, going to be interesting. We're going to go from like graduate school to back to elementary school a little bit. Um, <laughs> This was originally supposed to be part of the more foundational stuff uh, yesterday, but um, unfortunately I had to come out. Um, I'm in my parents' house. Um, my parents are uh, getting older, so had to come out for a visit. Um, so anyway, yeah. Um, uh, so the end of a long day for you and kind of uh, lunch for me. Yeah. Awesome, great. Um, I think that uh, you know, we're just glad you're able to still do this. So we really appreciate you taking the time. Um, I'm going to stop the recording and restart it just so that we can have a separate recording link on the web page when we're done and then um, we'll get started.